Thank you very much to everyone who managed to attend this session. Uh, we had more than 749 people actually registering for this particular session. I'm sure others will join us as, as we go through the, the session. The focus of the session is really to talk about performance management, which we feel, uh, based on our experience, that uh, uh, in some instances is not being done properly for various reasons. Some that are to do with the procedural issues, some are to do with just understanding the science behind performance management. And we'll touch on, uh, on all these issues. Uh, David will also take you through the automation side of performance management so that you can then see if automation can then help you to address some of the challenges that you are facing. But before you do that, there will be issues that we need to, to, talk, to talk about uh, that I will cover in this particular session. The starting point in talking about performance management is the strategy, the company strategy or the organization strategy. You can't divorce your performance management system from a strategy as a, as a business or an organization. That's key to, to understand. Because the strategy, the assumption in your strategy is that you are defining the direction that you want your business to take. And that direction must be very clear. It must be it must not be muddled. Uh, and also, what is even more important is the cascading of that strategy to the uh, various levels within the organization. It's translated into various components that people that are supposed to implement the strategy can understand. It could be frontline staff. Uh, there will be a way of cascading the strategy to the level and the detail that they can influence. Uh, 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 the, the last part under the strategy is that uh, there must be a monitoring mechanism. I'm highlighting the issue of strategy in the sense that uh, some people just start performance management. They think performance management is just, is just assessing people's performance. It's not. Performance management goes beyond just assessing people's performance in the sense that it goes, it, 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 it aligns with the way your business wants to, want to go. And we'll see as we go if this makes sense. There was the study that was done. Uh, this is the latest study that has been done and one that I found to be very useful. Uh, probably one of the many, but uh, one of the latest study uh, where a meta-analysis of 87 correlations from 31 empirical studies to determine whether strategic, planning, uh, uh, whether strategic planning is a positive impact on organizational performance. And you know what the results are? It shows that strategic planning is a positive moderate and significant impact on the organization performance. I've also attached the link. When you get a PDF version of this of this presentation, you can actually click there and go to the study. So strategic planning actually impacts performance. Why are we starting there? Because remember we said your strategy, your performance management system must start where your strategy is. Where are you? The stra this strategy could be written and written as long as there's clarity in terms of where you're going, as long as the people that work in your organization can understand whether written or written, where you want your business to go and how you are going to get there. Okay, so that is key. And we have already seen from this study, when you, when you look at this, because meta-analytic study is probably one of the best evidence that you can find in terms of science. And they are saying that they looked at 31 uh, scientific studies and looked at 87 correlations, looking at strategic, uh, looking at uh, uh, strategic planning and organizational performance. And they found a, a moderate but significant co co correlation uh, between uh, strategic planning and performance. That should give you enough ammunition to be able to align your, your business to your, to, your, to your strategy. We know that 90% of organizations' strategies fail at implementation. The, the organization can have a written strategy, but the 90% fail. This is uh, derived from the book by David Norton and Kaplan uh, on the balance scorecard, 90%. But I also went a step further to look at other studies that have been done. Uh, and in 2005, there's a report that shows that 10 to 30% of intended strategies uh, are successfully implemented. So you can see the range is still within what Norton and Kaplan found, which is the 10 to 30% of the strategies being uh, implemented. And when you look at this, it just says to you, one out of 10 organizations are able to implement their strategy, okay? If you want to be more broad, it says three, only three out of 10 organizations can implement the strategy. That's a very high failure rate to implement the strategy. This does not mean that you don't have a strategy in your business. It, it, it just means that the strategy is there, but there's no mechanism for uh, implementing the strategy to make sure that whatever you agreed, is fulfilled through the strategy implementation. And that's an important statistic to, to take note of as we go through the, the presentation. And you can see overall, the percentages can range. I went through a lot of research for the past few days 
the percentages can range, but uh, uh, you will find that on average you're looking at uh, that 10 percent, while these others are, look, are saying 10 to 30 percent. While there is no consensus, I, I don't think we should concern about consensus whether it's 10 percent or 30 percent, but we can see that a significant number of organizations are unable to implement or the, the, the company strategy. And that's a, a vote of no confidence in, 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 in the business and organization that spend a fortune trying to make sure that they implement, they develop the strategies. And for every year, it's a ritual. Organizations go out there to come and to go and, 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 and design company strategies. But the unfortunate part is that it, after doing that, they spend very little resources in actually ensuring that that strategy is implemented to the fullest within the organization. That's why we are getting this high rate of failure of organizations in implementing uh, their strategies. Then uh, well, I also went deeper to find out why are we bothered about performance? Remember, we started with the strategy and we've discovered that strategy actually has an impact based on those uh, the meta-analytic study that we saw. But why, why are we bothered about performance management? There's a study that was done uh, in, in 2011. It investigated performance management systems in 16 world-leading firms and found that certain facilitating practices, I want to repeat, the 16 leading firms, and they found that certain facilitating uh, practices, such as taking a broader view of performance management is one, involving senior managers in the process, clearly communicating performance expectations, formally training performance directors, uh, can enhance the effectiveness of performance management systems. That's key. We will talk more about some of the issues, but th th that's a summary. If people are not clear on the expectations, committed and expectations, and getting these expectations means that you, you are giving people an opportunity to, to put things on paper. I said, this is what we wanted to achieve, and they commit to it. Okay, and you periodically go back to look at that performance. Where are they in relation to those the commitment that we will never get? Involving managers is key, and more importantly, training the people that are going to use your system. Uh, in performance management. Uh, what do you find sometimes in, in, in practice that people do generic training in performance management? That does not help you that much. You must look at your own unique situations. Where are the gaps in terms of performance management? Where are the gaps in terms of performance feedback, for example? Then focus on those, put the necessary performance around those areas and you find that you may be lucky. Your performance management system uh, may work. So performance management in simple terms, you're looking at a process for agreeing on what needs to be achieved and how to track it. it, it basically looking at how you report progress on performance management. That's key. How agree on what needs to be achieved, which is exactly what I was, I was talking about in the previous slide. You are agreeing on the expectations in black and white. Then you must also agree that we are going to be talking about uh, how we are going to be performing, whether it's an individual, whether it's in a department, we are going to be talking about how we are achieving that performance, uh, it, 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 depending on how frequently you want to report on that. But I'll talk more from science, what it's saying about feedback uh, as a tool for making sure that we, 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 we improve performance. One of the biggest challenges in managing performance, especially if you look at some of the stress like in Zimbabwe and some other countries, is that there are contextual factors that are important to take note of. The company culture, the organization's culture can make people uh, less competent. Even good people, I'm sure you know in football, for example, there are stars who have, come, who have uh, uh, joined teams from where they were doing extremely well in another team. They join another team and they look like they're useless. It's the culture. The culture of an organization, it can actually make some people incompetent. So you, you, when you look at performance management, you must make sure that all the other levers, the connectors within that are all aligned. Resource availability is a key issue. You don't expect people to, be, to perform miracles when there are no resources. In your planning, in your setting your goals, all these things must be agreed upfront. Okay, the general economic and political environment be taken in is the context. You must take that into consideration as you are setting goals. There is no need to set goals that you know are not going to be achievable, achievable given your resources, given your culture, given your political environment. It's good to try, but an acknowledgement of the constraints in the management of performance within your business is important. But don't use this as an, as an excuse. Why am I highlighting this at the beginning? We find in some instances, people start arguing about oh, this economic environment, or oh, this factor was an issue at the time of appraisal. 
when there's continuous dialogue within the business around performance, uh, even between individuals, the manager, the subordinate, uh, in the departmental, the departmental, or at the executive level, if we have been dialoguing and talking about it, this issue every day, there are no surprises. We must not then get to, when you get to actual appraisal, you're just taking stock of what you've been talking about. That's how a, a system works. It can't be a surprise. It can't be a history lesson. It has to be what we've been talking about. So there are no surprises in, 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 in when, you, when you do that. Then there are also factors that are important to take note in the sense that uh, when we say performance, do we focus only on those that are performance, job specific performance? If you're a salesperson, are you selling? If you're an accountant, are you producing financial results? If you're if you an HR manager, are you uh, hiring the right talent? What about contextual factors? Contextual factors are, are those other are enablers around the individual. It's a choice that you can make as a business. For example, teamwork, uh, innovation. But all these things, again, they're inputs into the ultimate results. If you're focusing on the results, but others uh, uh, they believe that they must measure both outcomes or results and also measure inputs into the performance. It's entirely up to you. Uh, if it works for you, it's okay. But there's more, you can actually also face a challenge where you find that people are hitting the, all these uh, inputs, they are succeeding, but the outputs are not actually coming. Why is that the case? It's simply because uh, uh, the, the, the major issue that we need to focus on is the output, which is the ultimate performance of a business. Uh, so th there is enough uh, uh, reason for us to be able to target and focus on performance. So what does scientific evidence say about what makes performance management work? We, we, we One, uh, uh, I will share the links with you as well. The harder uh, the, the, or the challenge in the goal, the more it is likely to motivate the individual. And this has been proven. Locke and others have done experiments, actual experiments on goal setting. And they found that the more challenging the goal, the person must feel challenged by the goal. The more challenging the goal is to the individual, the more likely they are going to exert more effort in actually trying to achieve that goal. So that's key. Uh, but you also the goal must be within the reach of the individual for them to be able to uh, to, 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 to to exert enough effort into the into uh, towards that goal. Then the one of the things that have been found through research is that as you are setting your goals, ensure that it, there is something in it for the employees. Okay, and this is not does not necessarily mean monetary value to the employee. Uh, what will motivate this employee to want to achieve this goal? Make it conditional. Uh, 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 to the employee, we must make it conditional. Uh, only if we if, if, if anticipate that we will be happy if the goal is achieved, that's when science says you are likely to exert more effort into that particular goal. What's in it for me? Am I going to be happy when this goal is achieved? Okay, and also if the employees feel that this performance that they're being pushed to do is actually linked to rewards of some sort, not necessarily monetary rewards. They are likely to exert a more, 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 more effort. Okay, uh, the employee themselves must feel their effort to result in the goal being achieved. This talks to the issue of being is it achievable. There is no point in giving someone a goal where they resign from that goal immediately after you have given. Them. It doesn't help you in in making sure that uh, you are actually focusing on performance. These are small things, but look at them. If you put them together in your performance management system, you are likely to get more value. There's a lot of money and a lot of resources that are being wasted in the performance management systems if they're not done properly. We have seen people harassing people to submit their appraisal forms, harassing people to make sure that the managers do appraisals because they're not seeing a benefit. It must start from the people seeing that there's a benefit. And if I get it, if I, if I achieve these targets, I'm going to get something out of it. It's going to enhance my career, okay? So certain specific goals inspire higher performance. And that has been established through both field studies, experiments, and other forms of research. Um, so, so one of the things that you must avoid when you are setting goals or, or, or when you're managing performance is to just to say to employee, uh, do your best. Uh, do your best results in zero improvement in, in, in job performance. You must work on specific, challenging, but uh, achievable goals. Here is one of the most interesting findings out of uh, research that we looked at. Too many goals to reduce effort. Okay? I know there are some organizations where you can get 50 pages of an appraisal form. I'm actually wondering 
how, how does someone do 50 pages of an appraisal form? What exactly would you be writing in that appraisal form? 50 pages. What exactly are you writing? Even 10 pages, what exactly are you writing? I do believe that any one of us, whatever level you are, a page is enough for anything. For a page is enough. Remember your, your performance appraisal form, which is your scorecard, is not is, is not your job description, is not your strategy. Okay. Because when you go now to drill down and put things on paper on that one page scorecard, you are not, you are taking it from your strategy, wherever it's coming from, it could be department or immediate supervisor, but you are now drilling down into the fine detail of what needs to be done in high priority areas that we need to focus on in order for you to achieve your goals. Okay? So the thing shows that the, the more goals an employee has, the more poorly they perform. This is key. I'm sure you can even tell from your own uh, anecdotal evidence. If you get too many things put on you, uh, your effort is divided on those issues. Performance tends to suffer. Okay. And others think piling uh, goals and activities on the employee is the best way to make them do more. But science says, in actual fact, they're going to do less. They're going to achieve less simply because. Uh, they, are, they were divided uh, 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 attention. The same point that I'm trying to highlight on this particular slide. When the boss keeps on adding extra projects to a good performer, their performance starts uh, going down. Okay. So how do we make uh, performance management more successful? You must build a system that people com get people committed to a few challenging goals and give them feedback along the way. If I would summarize. You must get people committed to the few, very few goals. In some cases, even three goals. In some cases, four. In some cases, five. Okay. Imagine what you could achieve as, as, an, as, 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 a, uh, as, as a business or as an organization. If you were to focus your attention on, on, on just a few goals, you take a few goals and say, in, if in this organization, we are not going to give anyone more than five goals. But the five goals that we are going to give them, they are going to be high priority, high value, high impact goals. And people work on those just for a quarter. Imagine, just for a quarter. And you get people committed to those five goals instead of those 10, 20 goals. I can assure you, you can already see. So even, even if I was not looking at science, what science is saying, on my own, I can already tell if I got five goals where I was supposed to have 20, I surely would be able to give, give uh, more effort into that. If it was possible to just have one, one or two goals, we would do that. But we know that the scope could be much wider and the priorities would be also much wider. But I wouldn't recommend that you to give people more goals. You must focus on the, the few. Okay. Then what has been also found is that uh, supervisors who have got a positive regard for subordinates, uh, uh, they are also found to, all, to give more lenient appraisal ratings, more greater halo effect, reduced accuracy, less inclination to punish poor performance. So there are some supervisors who just, you know, admire, love certain subordinates. Not, not necessarily that they're doing anything wonderful. They just have a liking for them. So if you ask that same supervisor to go and appraise the individual, you see that uh, uh, they are more lenient in terms of how they are present, and they are unlikely to do with poor performance of such subordinates. Okay. Then, when you look at criticism, okay, uh, 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 research shows that criticism tend to work better. I want to take note of this. Criticism tend to work better in situations where there is already a good positive relationship between the boss and the subordinate. That's what I'm saying. So if the relationship is already sour between the boss and the subordinate, uh, whatever feedback you're going to give is going to be seen in bad light by the person receiving that. But when there is a positive relationship between the manager and the subordinate, you'll find that uh, the, 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 the feedback is taken uh, uh, in, a more positive, uh, in a more positive way. Let's look at some of the tips uh, that you can use in order to, to actually get a, a proper performance management system. Eliminate complexity. That's number one. Uh, please avoid complexity. One page, simple way to assess people, simple way to set goals, nothing complicated. I must not set the whole day in order for me to be able to agree with goals with one individual, in order for me to do an appraisal for, for one individual. I know some people are doing appraisals 
They have to lock their door, which is okay. They have to go and eat first so that they can have the energy. They, they have to, uh, you know, setting a, a four or five hours of doing an appraisal. So what were you doing all along? Uh, when you, uh, from the time that you set the goals to the time, this particular time, what exactly were you doing? So these are challenges. You make the system very simple and less complicated. It makes life easy. Uh, uh, you don't want a system that saps energy out of the people. Use a very simple form to capture one page. If you look at a bond paper, just look at one bond paper. All these things of a bond or bond paper. Even if you're a CEO, I don't see any reason why your performance appraisal should be more than one page. What exactly will you be putting there? The A4 size is actually big enough to accommodate any performance management goals that are high priority, that are high impact, that are high value. They can fit on one page. The moment they go over to one page, uh, you're actually going to add any other things or any other business. We probably have priority issues, or you're not sure about the priorities uh, that, 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 that are important to your organization. That's key for us to, uh, to, to understand. Make goals measurable. Pick the right indicators. I'll talk about it, this as we, uh, uh, we go. We have already talked about it, uh, uh, focusing on the vital a uh, few. There is also a confusion that I normally see. People want to take their job position as after the performance uh, uh, appraisal or the, the performance target or the performance contract. Remember, your performance contract is speaking into the high priorities of the business at any given time. The job position is more generic. Okay, It can be their static this, the past four years. Uh, when you are setting the right goals, they must speak to your strategy. And your strategy generically is to your job description, but we are saying if the if the company is saying we are going north, it means that we 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 are moving uh, away from the generic job description related to the strategy. Okay, so I expect that when you are setting your goals, especially at the senior management, bit to management level, don't reference too much into your job description, which is a generic most of the time copied from the internet. You must reference the strategy. If I'm sitting here as a CEO, I then look at that and say, guys, we have agreed at board level. This is what we need to achieve. Okay. Well, you go to the HR manager, HR director, and say, how are you going to help me do this? You go to the sales and director, how are you going to help me do this? You go to operations, how are you going to help me do this? Audit, uh, legal, all the department that reports to you, you ask them all those questions. How are you going? It's not speaking to their job description. It's speaking to the strategy. That's what we want to do. It must speak to the strategy. At any given time, what is in your performance contract must speak to your strategy and less to your job description, which is more which is more generic. Okay. I was also looking at the research on weights, whether weights help in making sure that the performance management is more focused or uh, help the, the system to make sure that it's more effective. I the, 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 the research that I found so far, it says do not include weights. Uh, what they found that most of the weights have no scientific basis, they're actually arbitrary. You find someone goes to the goal, grow revenue, uh, whatever, whatever, and uh, they put a weight of 70%. Everything else is 30%. Okay? Where did you get it? Where is the science behind it? Okay? We know ultimately you must make money. But surely, if you put 70% on the financial, without uh, putting uh, more weight on the things that are going to make sure that you achieve the financials, what are you doing? How, how are you going to benefit as, as, as an organization uh, if, you, if you do that? Instead, the, the, the recommendation is that list the goals in order of importance. When you put them on your scorecard, just list them in order of importance. Okay? Uh, if you go to financial perspective of the scorecard, what is the top goal? You go to the different perspectives uh, 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 and things like that. Then I also went in deeper into finding out that allowing employees to participate in setting the goals help. Here is what I found. Should the managers in goal, impose goals? Here is what I found from research. I looked around everywhere. While there's generic research that says I include employees, but when you go to the meta analytic studies, you find that uh, it shows that participative goal setting has been found to have no difference in employee performance, whether the employee or the manager sets the goals. There's no difference in actual performance. And I wanted to take note of that. Participate, it feels good at first value that oh, we were involved in goal setting. But remember we said the goals don't come from the individual. It's not their personal goals. Even the manager, it's not their personal goals. The goals are defined at a higher level, at a board level. Then they are cascaded to the CEO. Then the CEO cascade those goals. 
whether I involve you in setting the, those goals or not, the research shows that there's actually no difference in whether the people, uh, if, you, if you do an experiment, say, uh, these people are the same, in the same role, divide them randomly, one group, we involve them in setting the goals, the other group, we give them, say, here are the goals, this is what you need to achieve. Uh, research shows that methods that work in gaining employee commitment are these ones. The first one, managers must explain the rationale for the goal and why it's important. Okay, that's what's important. You must just explain, okay, I want you to achieve a 30% growth in sales year on year, which is versus prior year. Why, why do you want me to do that? That must be explained. Okay, that must be explained clearly. So that, that's key for you for you to do. So the rationale behind the goals is important. Shido, can you can you admit people that are in the waiting room, please? Uh, so so that that's key for you to be able to do that. Explain the rationale behind uh, behind the goals. Okay. Uh, then when we look at feedback, uh, people are arguing about feedback. Does feedback help in terms of managing performance? Yes, it does. Uh, but in other situations, it, it, it has no apparent effect. Uh, in, in actual fact, when you look at some of the studies, they say it actually harms performance. Let's look at one under what conditions. Okay. While feedback is generally known to improve performance, it has been found that in over one third okay, of the studies conducted, feedback actually resulted in a decrease in performance. Here are some of the reasons uh, why that feedback has not been found to be useful. Feedback is less effective when it threatens the self-esteem of the individual. Uh, basically, reaction, anger. Uh, when you go and give feedback and you divert that feedback, instead of focusing on the factual information that you're giving to the individual and where they need to go, what they, what they may need to do, or, 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 or ask them what they may need to do, instead of saying, you are useless, uh, you are incompetent, all those kind of words, they tend to harm the individual self-esteem. Individual personality also affects uh, how the people will get feedback, will not get much into that because it's a whole area uh, on its own. Uh, the research has shown that the feedback is more effective when it's perceived as fair. Okay? When the individual that are giving feedback says, oh, this is fair, they actually uh, tend to tend to be more, have more positive results. And it also needs to be detailed and specific uh, as it leads to better improvement in terms of, uh, uh, of performance. Okay, uh, then when employees trust their supervisor, we also found that uh, it, it shows that uh, in that case, uh, they, they're more likely to take negative feedback as a way to improve their performance if there's trust between the employee uh, and the supervisor. Uh, frequency of feedback depends on the type of goals and level of employee. Some people think, oh, let me give this individual more frequent feedback. Uh, but what we are finding is that uh, uh, Research shows that when employees receive negative feedback, they feel that the review process is less fair, and this feeling can last up to six months after the review. Look how damaging. When the employee feels that the feedback was less fair, they, uh, you can see they, they, when they receive negative feedback that they feel was less fair, it can last for, for up to six months. Okay? Um, so if, if you give people feedback, especially focusing on the, the strength, the accomplishments, the uh, uh, employees tend to perform better on the job four months later compared to those who receive the traditional feedback, which is what we're saying is actually wrong. Okay. Recent studies have also shown that contrary to popular belief, more frequent feedback does not necessarily improve performance. Okay, I want you to understand that. More frequent feedback does not necessarily improve performance. Instead, Employees will perform better when they receive detailed but less frequent uh, feedback. Detailed but less frequent feedback. Uh, here is another important uh, thing to take note. Uh, immediate feedback works better for more procedural and easy tasks or more frequent feedback. While delayed feedback is more effective for difficult tasks, where the learner has to look at new concepts, has to conceptualize uh, what they, they, they need to do, uh, this delayed feedback gives the learner an opportunity to reflect on what they're doing. There are certain jobs where you can just not every day or twice a week you are giving feedback. But for more procedural kind of task, more, more, more frequent feedback is actually uh, more, more important. Okay, let's look, uh, before I go to the ballot program, let's look at uh, this uh, on the 360 degrees feedback. We know a lot of people are using 360 degrees feedback. It's a whole area, whole area on its own. There's a lot of research around that. Uh, but it is currently, it just shows that introducing 360 degree feedback for appraisal purposes 
Yes, in many cases, dropped it. Uh, many companies have actually have ended up dropping it within two years of implementing it for various reasons. And there's a lot around that. The format, the way it's done, the structure, the use of information. There's a lot of research around <laughs> what needs to be done. Uh, and if you do it in, in another way, what are the consequences? Okay. Then there's also no complicity the evidence around it. I know a lot of people say, when we are doing appraisals, we must also include a, a, a discussion about uh, developmental issues. Uh, performance, let's talk about performance. This is what you're supposed to do. This is what you've achieved. This is what you've not achieved. But let's also talk about developmental purpose. But I didn't find any conclusive evidence whether, on whether that works better or not. So far, I would say there's no really uh, additional value that you can find. You can do it, but there's no uh, 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 additional value. While you say I've looked at that scientific evidence, I also want to highlight that it, everything that you find in science is actually situational or contextual. In the sense that, in actual fact, some of the things that we're talking about, some work for you, some don't. But on the average, the things that I have highlighted to you are those things that you need to attend to if you want your performance management system uh, to work. One of the things that we found is that uh, uh, when you use labels, uh, they actually encourage you not to use numerical ratings in the early stage of performance management system. Uh, they say they add complexity. What is a one? What is a two in performance management? If you have ever reflected on that. Uh, instead, they say, why don't you use labels like goals, goals were met, goals were exceeded, goals were not met. Imagine, someone just knows this goals were not met or goals were met. It's something like that, very simple. You reduce, uh, uh, uh. but so far, no particular scale is preferred. Each scale that you use, there is evidence that shows what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages, some of them uh, from some form of experimental uh, uh, studies. Then I know a lot of people do include self-assessment. Even without scientific research, I have always doubted the value of self-assessments, for example, especially if it's, if it's not received the degree assessment. Uh, if you have agreed you are supposed to grow your sales by 30% in dollars, we have agreed you're supposed to bring 20 new customers every week and it's actual quantitative number. What will be the purpose of, of a self-assessment? In, in, in fact, what should then happen is just I asked my subordinate, please, we agreed on this target, this goals and target. Go and put your actuals. And me as the boss, I would then come in and validate the, the actuals before we even start the discussion. Okay, you said we, we agreed on a 33% growth year on year on year on year. We achieved the 20. We, please, I touch the end. We agreed that you're going to bring 20 new customers every week. Every, every week. You brought in 15 on average for every week. Uh, please, I tell you, you list the customers, how much value they brought. That's more credible rather than say going to do a self assessment. Uh, when we have agreed we need to achieve uh, 20 new customers, so what self assessment would, would how would self assessment help? It doesn't. So, uh, self assessments they are found to be of very little uh, value. The other danger, even if you are managed, we are assessing behavioral issues. Uh, research shows that the less competent someone is, the more likely they are to overrate their performance. Take note of that. The less competent someone is, the more likely that they are over, uh, to overrate their performance. And if you're going to have a discussion with that particular individual, you can imagine they, they, they rate themselves uh, and, and they can't, they, 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 after rating themselves, there's then a discussion. You can imagine it. How, how, how deadly or how, how negative that discussion uh, is, is, is going to be. So that, that's key to, 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 to take note of. Then goal setting is key. I now want to move uh, to, to, to actually write on the balance scorecard. Most of the time, I find people struggle with setting the right goals, regardless of whatever system they are using. Uh, it's a struggle. When you read some of the things, they're actually not goals. I don't know what they are. Uh, so what gets measures get done, that's what people say. But obviously, there is, I have not seen any scientific evidence to support that. But it's a, it's a nice term to, to use. Let's look at the balance scorecard. The balance scorecard was developed by David Norton and Kaplan. And I will first of all look at uh, what you call a profit-making kind of organization. Where, when you look at the balance scorecard, remember the genesis of the balance scorecard was that uh, uh, David Norton and Kaplan were very concerned when they did that. They said, they said that there were companies that were doing extremely well in terms of financial performance. But a few years later, they disappeared. They collapsed simply because they were too much focused on the financial uh, outcomes of the business. We know that's the, what the shareholders want. But sustainability going long term is not only about financials. That's why they came up with the balance scorecard, which basically looks at four perspectives of the business. And these four perspectives are the financial, customer, internal business process, and learning and growth. And when you look at these, 
The financial perspective, basically speaking to the voice of the shareholder, what are those priority financial goals that we need in order to deliver value to the shareholder? We need to grow our revenue. We need to market to, to, to manage our costs. We need to make, well, if we manage our costs, grow revenue, we are likely to make money, uh, uh, profit for the shareholder. It's more generic, it's standard, okay? Uh, that, that's, how, that's how you look at it. So the financial perspective is basically looking at the shareholder in terms of value, financial value that you're creating. Shareholders invest their money in your business in order to get a return on that on, on that investment. So that's the financial perspective. But in order for you to make money in, in your business, you need to make sure that you look after the customer. What is What value proposition are we giving to our customers and are we delivering on that value proposition? As simple as that. What is it that we're doing? In order, if we are promising quality, are we giving it? If we are promising good service, are we giving? It? If we are promising value addition, are we giving it? That, that's exactly what you look at under customer. And if customers are not getting value, they will go take their money elsewhere. It's as simple as that. And that money fits itself in your loss of uh, of market share. That's why under customer we also measure market share because it manifests that in, in that. Uh, are you growing in terms of customer numbers, the volume of customers that are coming to you? And for example, if you were to look at telecoms companies, we always uh, know, look at they always look at the number of subscribers, we, those number of subscribers, if they're transacting, they must be uh, then translating into, into financial outcomes. In some cases, under customer, for example, for a telecoms company, they may look at issues to do with the revenue per customer or have revenue per user. But those are some of the indicators that they track. So you can see the connect, it's a cause and effect relationship. You want to make money, you must look after your customers. But more importantly, if you look at the, the cause and effect relationship, the, the internal business processes, this is where the value creation is. If you're a manufacturing company, are you producing products of the highest quality? Are you producing a product that people want to buy? Are you producing products of value to the customers that you have? Uh, your turnaround processes. What are you doing about the, the, the quality of those products in terms of health, environment, safety, and all those things? They all come, come under internal business process. If a bank, your internal process, the downtime of your processes, the, your business channels, the channels that you're using, online, mobile, all the other issues that you can think of. Are they delivering value to the customers? What is the usage of those systems? They come under internal business process. Compliance, governance, all those issues come under, 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 under internal business process. Then at the anchor of this, you then find the learning and growth perspective. Uh, in, other, in other organizations, they just call it the people side. Okay? And the people, what you're saying there and the people is that uh, what the biggest question that you must ask yourself when you get to the learning and growth is, what do we require from our people in order to deliver on our strategy? What do we require from our people in order to deliver, to deliver on our strategy? Remember, at this stage, you are still talking at a very high level, board, CEO level, at a strategic level. Because we are driving this, the, 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 what we are putting into those perspectives from our strategy. The center, what is it? The center there of that uh, particular slide is the strategy that we are taking from that, that strategy, the strategy document or strategy that we have written or unwritten. That's what way we are getting it. So under learning and growth, I think, what is it that we require from our people in order to drive the strategy of the organization? We require people who are engaged, who are motivated, who are satisfied with what they're doing. We require people who love what they're doing, who are enjoying what they're doing. We require people who have got the skills that we require to drive this particular business. We require people who are motivated. These are the things that must bother you uh, uh, when you have to start looking about your people. You can have a, a top of the range internal business processes. But if there are no people to drive it, they're not going to work. You can have uh, the good customer service systems, even the market, the opportunity to grow the business is there in terms of market. But if you don't have the people to drive that, it won't happen. That's exactly what you're saying there. So customer, uh, uh, when you look at that, you can see the connections. And the relationship is not directly just a, from learning to growth into going to internal business process. There are things that go under people that directly impact the customer. There are people that you do under learning and growth that you directly impact the, the internal business processes. Okay, That's why you'll find other people prefer to call the learning, learning and growth, learning, growth, and innovation. I would not worry about what to call it. What matters is it capturing your strategy in the manner that the David Norton Kaplan actually envisaged so that you don't then have to focus your business on just the financial. But we know in practice that most of the people, when they're doing their strategy, they normally focus on make sure that they just make money. They don't care about anything else, which is bad. So that, that, that's the, the whole visualization. The top. Then as you go into the department, someone say, I'm in HR. So how, do I, how do I fit in into this particular perspective, into this particular situation? The financial perspective applies to HR. 
Uh, and if you are not in a revenue generating uh, function and you're in a support function, we do expect you to, to make sure that you focus on making sure that all the resources that you get bring value to the business, which means we are, we are in, incurring costs, but those costs, are, they, are, are we getting value out of it? For example, if you are paying people, are we getting return on that dollar value? Uh, if you are paying people whatever amount we are paying, what is the return on our salaries for every dollar that we pay? That uh, that uh, that is your under your financial position from an HR point of view. Uh, are you complying with your budget? You've been given the budget. Are you overspending? You're not worried about eating into the shareholders' uh, 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 profitability when the business when they then don't get their, their money. These are issues that you need to look at. Customer HR is good customer. Okay, these are line managers and the employees themselves. Internal business process is probably more an internal business. Your turnaround time around recruitment, your compliance issues in HR, your governance issues in HR, your industrial relations issues in HR. Are you always losing cases simply because your managers are not following the procedures that you have actually created for your business? Learning and growth again. If you as you go to individuals and departments, you may start even in HR. You are saying, in order for me to support this business, what skills do I require in HR? If you are, if you are the HR director, I may want analytic skills. Do I have them? I, I may want uh, digital skills. Do I have them? I want industrial relations skills. Do I have them? So whatever you put under learning and growth must be in relation to what you want to achieve as a department, which we are assuming is connected. To the business performance. So if we did well, and the assumption that we have made in coming up with that is, is, is are correct, it means there must be a cause and effect relation. If HR is doing well in the things that we have said they must prioritize, it must have a spillover effect on the business as a whole. The same applies to marketing, the same applies to IT, the same applies to legal, the same applies to audit. All these are support functions that must feed into the business. And all of them can fit within the, the framework uh, of, of the scorecard. Then when you go now to, uh, to, to, to the non-profit making organization, not much difference. Under the financial perspective, the focus there is not on uh, make, being profitable. The focus is in resource mobilization. That's where the focus is under financial. And the band rate, you have raised money in order to uh, undertake certain projects. Are you utilizing that money there? How much of that money has been used within a period that we've agreed with whoever is funding that project? So that's key uh, to, to be able there. The issue of cost will also come in under there. The, the customer in this instance is the stakeholder. We are doing certain intervention in order to impact the lives of certain stakeholders in society. Are we achieving that? How many households have we actually managed to help? And what is the impact assessment of that? There are so many indicators that you can use there. And in order for us to deliver the, the internal process, which include governance, compliance, and systems, this could be IT or whatever format, they also come in there. Learning and growth no different from the private sector. What may differ is you have, in, in, when you're asking what kind of skills do we require in order to drive our strategy. In a non-profit making organization, the, 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 the framework may change a bit in the sense that the skills that we require in a, a highly competitive telecoms industry are not necessarily the same that you require in a non-profit making organization. In, 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 a, in a non-profit making organization, uh, or whether international or local that is uh, operating in your in, 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 in that you are that you are working for so it's the same you can see the cause and effect is, is, is the same but if you look at the financial ultimately when i looked at the the private sector one you know that the ultimate goal is really for to make sure money for the shareholder in the 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 non-profit making organization the what is at the top is normally the stakeholder okay followed by the resource mobilization, followed by the internal process, then the learning and growth. But again, they are all interchangeable. They, they are all interlinked in a cause and effect relationship. But the, the model is the same. So many people have been asking me, so yes, we know the framework of the balance scorecard, but how do I build the scorecard? How do I, where do I start? You can see from there, uh, the first column that you need to have is what is called a goal. That's what you need. For example, our goal is to grow revenue, okay? Then you have got the column that looks at the measure and KPI. And the KPI there is revenue growth year on year. Okay. And the best target of 15% and the stretch target of 18%. If you want to have best of stretch, it's entirely up to you. And I will explain those uh, later on. Then the target period. The target period is the period within which you must achieve that goal. Okay. It could be weekly. It could be monthly. It could be quarterly. It could be half year. It could be after every two years. It could be yearly. Okay, so you, you can see how smart this goal is. You can do this for every individual in the organization. And remember, we're talking about priority goals. This would be just five goals on this page. 
but written in with such clarity uh, for, 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 your, for your organization. You can go in there and put another goal, okay? Uh, 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 you can have another goal that says, for example, grow export revenue as the, as the goal. Okay, our measure is growth in uh, export revenue year on year. We want a 3% growth and, 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 and a 5% growth, and this is a yearly target. You can add another one, uh, another goal, manage costs, okay? Our measure will be cost to income, depending on the business, and our cost to income target is 36%, first line, <coughs> and stretch target of of 34%, okay? So you can see, when you want to reduce something, the best line is higher than the stretch. When you want to increase something, the stretch is higher than your, your best line. So this is the, the template if you, want, if you want to do the scorecard. So under each perspective, you go through this kind of thing, that this is the template for, for each, kind, for each uh, particular uh, perspective. Okay, let, let, let's, let me... Take you, yeah, so the, just to explain under, under the goal and measure. When we go under goal, let me go back to this. So when you under goal, the, the key question that you ask yourself is what do you want to achieve? You want to grow revenue, okay? And remember, the goal must always start with a verb, an active verb. You can't start your goal by saying revenue. You can't say, I can't say to you, what do you want to achieve? And you say, I want to revenue. You can't do that because that's a noun. What do you want to do? I want to grow revenue. What do you want to do? I want to grow market share. What do you want to do? I want to manage cost. What do you want to do? I want to retain talent. That's how you set out. They must always start with an active verb. Avoid starting the goal with two or a noun. So ad adjectives and nouns should never be part of the starting part of your word in a goal. That's key for you to understand. Then when you go to the, the, to the measures or KPIs, what is it that we are going to track in order to see whether we are succeeding on our goal? Remember, it's always in reference to, to the goal. So when we say we want to grow revenue, what is it that we are going to track in order for us to, to, to see whether we are winning or not? We are going to see where or check our revenue year on year. We are going to check our market share if we are looking at market share growth. We are going to check our, uh, if you are looking at managing costs, we are going to look at our cost to income ratio. Yeah, that's how you look at it. So the KPI is very simple, nothing more than that which we look at in order to track the success or failure of our goal. Okay? It must always link to the goal. The KPI must always be linked to the goal. That's how, that's how we look at it. And broadly, what is a target? A target is the desired level of performance. It can't be a debt. A target is the desired level of performance. It can't be a debt. Okay? So that, that's very clear. So when we say, what is a target? It's the desired level of performance. And it should never be a debt. And more importantly, as we have done this, uh, I know some people mix activities and goals. They are not sure. I want to take an example. Let's say uh, uh, there was a beekeeper uh, with section A uh, and section B, uh, this beekeeper. In section A, the bees were measured on the number of flowers visited. Let's just put that down. Number of flowers. Uh, 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 remember, the whole purpose of bees is for you to be able to, uh, to make honey. So they were measured the, the section A, they were measured the number of flowers visited. In section B, they were measured on the amount of nectar collected. Uh, nectar collected. Clearly, you can see that B would be more successful because they are not focusing more on the results. We are not saying don't visit the flowers, but we are saying let's start with the results. If you are setting goals, start with the results. If you want to infuse with the visiting the flowers, it's up to you. But I wouldn't do that. Visiting the flowers is what we call action plans or initiatives. Yes, I have agreed that we want to grow our revenue. Uh, and the, the measures revenue growth year on year, and we are targeting 15% as a minimum and a maximum of 18%. What do we need to do on the ground in order to achieve that? Those become part of the visiting of the flowers. But remember, you can visit the flowers and they fail to collect nectar. It, that's, what we, that's the essence of strategy. If you had put something uh, under, this is what we, because remember, you, are, you need to use the hypothesis thinking. So we need to grow revenue. What do we need to do in order to grow your revenue? We need to look for new customers. We need to open new markets. We need to do all the things. You can list five or 10. Those are your initiative, initiatives. Then you tick at the end of, of your view, let's just say a quarter, you think things are not happening, but you've done all the five initiatives. I mean, the strategies are wrong or they are not aligned to what you want to achieve or you face some challenges. That's the essence of, 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 a, of the strategy. So that must be very clear. Let's focus on output-based goals. Uh, you can still track 
the activities that our people are doing. I was talking to someone in the banking sector some time back, and what they were saying is that in, they said, look at our cockers. Uh, and I found someone at the cockers that says, uh, visit uh, 10 clients per week. Visit uh, 10 clients uh, per week. And I asked them and said, look, why are you visiting 10 clients per week? I said, oh, we want to, to get you new business. So new business. I said, what else? We want to get new clients. I said, what else? We want to retain uh, the current clients. I said, those are your goals, not necessarily visiting the customers. The visiting of the customer is the means to achieving new business, to achieving new clients, to achieve to retain your clients. So clarity of setting those goals is key in managing performance. We found some of the things, things are muddled. They are not very clear. You're mixing activities with the goals and people spend a lot of energy. They're running around chasing things that have no value to the business. So if, if someone says, okay, here's my log. I visit the 10 clients. Yeah, I hope you can give them a bonus. What a waste of resources and time, okay? So refine those to focus on the, the key outputs of that particular goal. And here's something that you can use when you're setting a goal, especially when you, when you want to look at, if you're struggling to get your KPI or measure. If you go back to that goal that I talked about, I will grow revenue in, in that section with the I will grow revenue as measured by revenue growth year on year. I will grow market share as measured by market share growth. I will reduce costs as measured by cost to income. I will retain staff as measured by staff turnover or retention. Very easy. That's the template that I use. You can't go wrong if you do it properly. You can't go wrong. It makes you refine uh, uh, the goals that you that you that you, that you have. Okay, that I have already covered. Let's just look at an example of an HR scorecard that I that I that I have used as a as a sample. I'll just quickly go through this so that we, we don't lose time. Okay, so you can see under financial perspective. I want to manage staff costs. What are my key, key two measures? Staff cost to budget, staff cost to income. Uh, my target is 100% of budget. My staff cost to income, 23%. Target period, this is a quarterly target. I got the next one. Reduce leave liability below industry average. Number of leave liability, uh, number of leave days per employee, 10 days quarterly. Okay? Uh, manage HR department operational costs, operational cost to the budget, and 100% compliance with that budget. We go to customer for the same HR, okay? Increase employee engagement above national average. Employee engagement index is 75%, and it's a quarterly target. We go to deliver business impact service line manage, uh, uh, deliver business impact service to line managers. We look at percentage uh, of HR intervention that results in demonstrative and quality for business impact, 65%. Then deliver high impact HR interventions uh, you can look at uh, that, that employee engagement uh, index. Then two other customer build a strong employer brand. You can see the staff turnover uh, of competent staff, 4%, and it's a quarterly target. Then acceptance offer, uh, percentage acceptance of offer letters. There are organizations, when they are recruiting, they, they offer a job to someone, they say, no, no, I can't accept it. I don't want the remuneration or some other reasons. They offer it to the next person. They don't want it. They offer it to the next person. Imagine if you've got 100 positions and all of them are being rejected. So your rejection rate will be very high. So what is your offer acceptance rate? You go to internal business process. Drive the setting and tracking of performance contracts uh, organization-wide. Percentage of employees who signed performance contracts 15 days into each quarter. Percentage of employees appraised as per agreed contracts 15 days after each quarter. And the target is 100 percent. Reduce industrial relation risk, percentage of higher cases lost due to technicality. You can see there zero. <laughs> then it is still in the inter internal uh, processes. Reduce industrial relation risk, percentage of cases referred to outside bodies versus total all cases handled five percent. Reduce vacant rates as approved for approved roles, vacant rates of two percent at any given time. Uh, practice good corporate governance along the HR value chain. Average back and that is wrong. That actually it's supposed to be audit findings. You can see the switch there. Okay. The learning and growth, develop talent, succession coverage ratio per critical role, 4%. Train staff to end or customers, percentage reduction in customer complaints from an average of 100 per month, 80% reduction. Increase core product knowledge across all staff categories. Percentage of staff scoring 75% and above on online product knowledge. I remember when I was working for Butler my early days in my career, they would actually come and announce and just say, you guys go into the boardroom, you actually write a product test. And they would do that, all the stuff, and the consequences were that you could actually go home at that time. 
Imagine, it forces your employees to actually have product knowledge of what you're selling. When they're talking to your customers, they don't keep on referring people to other people, okay? Then the other measure, look at that measure. Percentage of non-sales staff bringing in your business. That's what is called the HR. And you're actually getting more value to the business rather than doing generic stuff. And I'm assuming this will be coming from the strategy of the business uh, within your organization, okay? So there's more. Okay, so that's how you, you do the scorecard. And lastly, as I end my business, so they can allow them to take about 15 minutes to then just show you the key aspect of the, of the automated performance management system called performance management. It's started by Gallo found that employees who receive regular feedback um, are 50% more likely to be engaged. It's started by Adobe found that companies that use continuous feedback are 2.9 times more likely to be innovative. Look at this. It's started by CEB found that companies that use continuous feedback are 1.5 is more likely to meet or exceed their financial targets. Uh, all this is basically supporting what you find. They start by Deloitte, find that companies with highly aligned goals are two times more likely to achieve strategic objectives. 60% of organizations use automated performance management. This is a global, uh, global average. 95% of HR leaders, you look at this statistic, 95% of HR leaders express the feeling unhappy with the traditional performance review system. Imagine these are the custodians and they are unhappy. Okay. Uh, 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 and also there are so many other so many other things that you can get out of uh, performance management. Uh, and I think I've covered enough uh, in relation to what you need to do in order to make your performance management work. Uh, especially if you want to use this balance scorecard, you could see that how they climb uh, uh, when you're doing that uh, scorecard. Okay, I will allow David to do a, 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 his short presentation, then I can take questions. David, you can take over. David. All right, sure, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, please confirm that you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So, at a glance, this is what a scorecard looks like in the automated system. You have got the basics, the employee demographics. Then from there, you've got all the perspectives from financial, uh, stakeholder, or customer, internal processes, then organizational capacity. Then um, under each perspective, there is a string of goals, uh, depending on the perspective. So under financial, you've got all financial related goals. So here, as an example, you've got grow revenue, reduce cost, adhere to provided budgetary limits. We also have good examples of goals which fall under the customer perspective. Then um, for each and every goal, there are a set of uh, key performance indicators. It's okay for a goal to have more than one key performance indicator. It's not okay for a key performance indicator to exist in isolation. For each and every key performance indicator, it has to be tied to a particular goal. Okay? So for example, here under grow revenue, we can measure this by uh, revenue. Then we've got uh, foreign currency revenue. Reduced cost, we've got cost over income ratio. Then adhere to budgetary limits, we've got percentage budget variance. So you see that for each and every key performance indicator or measure, we've got different units that we can use to measure this. They range from dollars, numbers, percentages, depending on industry. Those in the manufacturing, you can have output related indicators like tonnage, kilograms, liters, etc. Then reporting frequency, we are basically here RF. If you click on the abbreviation, you see the full name. You see that RF uh, stands for reporting frequency. We are saying that uh, for each and every key performance indicator, how frequently should we collect data and develop uh, KPI reports? Then we've got uh, TP, which is our target period. Uh, what is the target period for that particular KPI or measure? Then each and every KPI has got a base target and a stretch target. Okay. Then uh, when you input your actual, you're actually able to get uh, a score, a performance score. So if you are to open here in detail, you see that um, for this particular goal, which is grow revenue, uh, we've got the period where the KPI report was generated. You see that this one is for November, 2023. Best target was 750 with a stretch of 800 and an allocated weight of 10. So if you score an actual of 752, uh, the performance score was uh, zero because we just barely met the best target. But here where we have got an actual of 800,000, where we met the stretch target, we've got an allocation of 10, which is the full figure on the allocated weight. 
So you see that if you exceed your stretch, you will not get more than your allocated weight. If you fail to meet your base, you will get a negative score. Uh, the system also allows you to attach evidence for any particular goal. <clears throat> it might be in the form of a KPI report or any other equivalent. So if you've got um, knowledge management platforms like SharePoint, you can just insert a link where the evidence or the report can be found. If you don't have such a uh, setup, you can attach the actual report here within the system itself. And whoever is reviewing your performance can easily be able to validate what you have put. Okay, if we come back to the scorecard, you see that um, we've got comments. The comment feature makes performance feedback a bit more agile. You don't have to wait for the end of the period to converse around how you're progressing. So it's similar to the way we use social media. You can have uh, conversations between a supervisor and a subordinate discussing how the goal is progressing and the kind of support which is needed. Okay, so here you can see a history of the comments like, I did not manage to reach my target because competition was high. There could be a response from the supervisor and so forth. So when you look at this, uh, we also have got an action plan feature. Action plans or strategic initiatives are the activities that we implement in order to meet our target. So once we have formulated our goals, selected our measures and set our targets, the targets are not going to meet themselves. We need to actually act on certain projects or programs to ensure that targets are met. So as an example for growing revenue, an initiative could be uh, carrying out a marketing campaign. It, on its own, it's got a lot of subtasks like draft a marketing budget, develop marketing content, create a calendar for carrying out promotional activities. And these are tasks that can be under a particular manager. It can be delegated to different people within the department so that we can collaborate uh, towards meeting our objectives. Okay, we've got uh, a trend indicator. So the advantage of the trend indicator is you can actually be able to see how we are progressing in terms of achieving the, the goal. It has got what we call control charts. Control charts are there to take the noise away from the numbers. When you say that numbers or measures are noisy, we say that they can fluctuate month on month. This month you can meet your target, the other month you fail to meet your target, but it's not a time to, to get worried. You should only get worried when your actuals are breaching particular lines. So we can start with the lower control line. The lower control line is showing, uh, on average, the worst numbers that have ever been recorded in that particular KPI. Then we have got the average line, which is our long-term average. It's basically just showing us, on average, how we have done on the particular measure, say maybe for the past four years. It tells us what we can do in the long term. Then the upper control limit shows us the best we have done on that particular measure, on average. So what you see that is that, um, they are what we call performance signals. Performance signals are observed when uh, a particular measure is uh, playing around a particular central line. So here, for example, if it's fluctuating month on month, we should not get worried. But if you see three or four data points skewed towards a particular control line, it's showing a shift in performance. So here, if you see four data points consistent, like here, within the period September, October, November, December, you can see our performance, the actual performance is oscillating around the lower control limit. This can be taken as a signal of a uh, deterioration in performance. Why? We are consistently scoring lower numbers than our average. And as such, our long-term average in the long term will also shift downwards, showing that performance is actually deteriorating. If we consistently have uh, the actual points around the average line, nothing much is going to change in terms of the average and performance is not changing. And then if you consistently score across the upper control limit, it's showing that uh, performance is shifting in the positive direction. So performance is beginning to improve. And in the long term, you also see that the long term average will also come up to reflect that uh, positive change in performance. Okay. So in a nutshell, that's a scorecard. So you see that this scorecard has got scores. Scores can be aggregated across different uh, levels. There's an aggregate score for the perspective. Then there's an aggregate score for all the perspectives showing you your overall achievement. You can have a um, score for action plans progress. You can also have another score for meeting your scorecard goals. And when you combine the two, you have your average, your overall uh, achievement. You see that uh, in terms of allocated weights, a scorecard is always scored out of 100. 
and um, we can actually distribute the weighting across different uh, perspectives. You see that in our presentation, we indicated that some organizations are recommended. We actually recommend not to use uh, weights, but organizations that prefer to have uh, a performance score uh, for their employees, they, it's inevitable to use uh, allocated weights because without allocated weights, you can't have performance in the form of a single score. So the advantage of weights is that they uh, allow you to aggregate performance. So if you put more weights in a particular perspective, you are basically saying that it's more important than other perspectives. And like what Mr. Ngu was saying, sometimes we allocate those weights without any scientific basis. So they are mostly arbitrary and subjective. And um, if you're not careful in allocating weights, uh, the system can be gamed. People can put higher weights on goals that are easier to achieve so that they distort their performance. Or sometimes you end up focusing on the things that don't really deliver value to the organization. Okay. So in terms of other features of the scorecard, it has got a scorecard module, it has got uh, of the system rather, it has got a scorecard module, it has got an action plans module, it also has got a reports module, which allows you to generate uh, performance reports that are showing how people are performing. Then several other features like the behavioral traits, you can actually assess people using the 360 degree assessment. Then it has got admin uh, modules where you can manage your employees, secure your system by locking your scorecards so that people are not able to manipulate scores or targets for any finalized periods. Then you can also maintain your system in terms of the perspectives, business units and so forth. It also has got an audit log, which allows you to see the activity that people are performing in the system. So you're actually able to see who is changing what in the system to ensure that your system is secure and your data has got integrity. All right, uh, thank you. That's an overview of the system. I will end back to Mr. Ngui. Uh, thank you, David. Maybe we can take one or two questions given the way time is. Then if uh, uh, this time around we have managed to record this particular presentation, which we should be able to say on Monday. The last time we had thought that we had recorded the, the, the presentation, but we then found it was not, uh, it was not uh, there. Are there any questions? If you have any questions, you can put in the chat or uh, you can actually just speak. Okay, it seems there are no questions. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, we'll share the, the presentation on, uh, on uh, for all the people that registered, we'll share the, 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 the present, the link to the, to the, to the, um, to the record, to, go to the recording, which you can download and the circular and share within your teams, within your own organization. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.